Okay, so welcome to part three. Here in part three, we're gonna start getting into the journey that Annika went through as she began to go through the healing process, go through the, ev the aftermath, if you will, of everything that sort of came after, how she went from, you know, going through an incredibly challenging period, incredibly ch challenging time in her life, to ultimately getting where she is today, which as you can see in the interview, yes, there's some, still some emotions and stuff like that, but for the most part, she is incredibly well sort of stable and at a state of peace about what has taken place, which is insanely inspiring when you begin to go through and you, you, you uh, pay attention to the rest of this journey here, which we'll talk about a little bit further as, as, as we get to the end of part four. But for now, let's dive into part three and really start seeing how this all sort of came together afterwards. So we left off before taking a break um, with this amazing story, which I'd love to talk to you about for hours. Um, and hopefully we get back to it uh, in some capacities. Um, this was, as far as I understand, pretty much the end of your involvement with the network. But you can, can you tell us what came after and then we'll move forward from there? Yes. So. He, uh, he told me to wait outside. There was a body in the room. So I waited outside. I remember sitting under an evergreen tree. And it was October of 1974. And I remember um, enjoying the breath. Just these very basic things that all became very poignant. And empty. He drove me home and on the way home it was raining. It was just pre-dawn. The wipers and he told me everything that I should do in my life. He told me instructions and the first one was that I should never become a prostitute that I should never sleep with anyone for anything, that I should never take any money, um, that I should never become a drug addict, that I should never do anything to get drugs, that I could take drugs only if they're given to me, but I should never um, do anything to get them. I should um, not become an alcoholic. I should have maybe one glass. I'm 11 years old. I should have maybe one glass or two a night, no more, no heavy liquors, stay away from the liquors. I should um, get out of this country. We're in Belgium. Yes, he said, you have to get out of this country. You don't want to be here in the 80s. You're going to get out as soon as you can. Go to London, Paris, New York. You're going to go to New York. And he said, uh, you're going to go back home. You've got to stay home with your parents, but you're going to get out as soon as you can. Just, um, just stay there until you know you're old enough to leave. Um, he told me you have to get married. He said you can't, you should not marry an older man who made his own fortune. You should marry someone who's younger, around your age, who comes from a wealthy family, preferably a family of New York bankers. That's what he said. Now, he was thinking about a particular perpetrator and that family. No. But I did have these, these um, instructions with me. I carried them with me. Um, he said, you should never speak about the network. If you ever say anything, then we're going to come after you and we're going to find you and kill you. So that was also very clear. Um, I think those are the main ones. And he drove me home. I reconnected with him emotionally, sexually, one last time so that I, I think intuitively to make sure that I would um, take those instructions very much to heart. And, and he, he then told me his whole story, his personal story of being abused, of being raped by, not he didn't call it rape, but he basically very shamefully uh, said that his father had stabbed him in the back of the knee as he had me and that um, 
his father had found him with his mother and that I guess he felt betrayed by him and so he had this this carried this thing on his shoulders always that he's a traitor and that he did betray me and he betrayed his friends and he did that but he also had that had, had that imposed on him by his his father who called him a traitor for sleeping with his mother when he was 12 years old so he gave me drugs to deal with my mother in the following weeks because he figured that she would be angry and so he gave me some opioids sleeping pills and everything and he said again don't take too much you can only take half a day no more um, but I um, and then he let, he set me he basically let me go I needed the drugs with my mother and she actually tried to take me back one last time and she did take me back one last time behind behind the back of the bosses clearly and to a group of uh, extremely um, sadistic aristocrats that I, I had seen one before I knew that children did not make it through the night with them and uh, they were they, she took me there it was in the kitchen of the castle it was after a hunt in the daytime and their prey was lying on the floor and um, the subject came up that I was a freebie and that um, it was said that my mother just couldn't help herself that I wasn't supposed to be used anymore and one of the men there that I'd not seen before, but I've recognized since as a, an, a European um, aristocrat, um, said, well, she wants us, my mother, wants us to do her dirty work for her. I'm not going to be part of this. He left, and another man left with him. Two other men left with him. Two men stayed. I was abused again. And that was the last time that I was taken to the network. Then I um, stayed home until I was 15, 16 years old. I wasn't home very much. I left school when I was 15. Um, I started having trouble at school to middle school. I doubled it uh, twice, actually. The eighth, eighth, ninth grade, I guess, I doubled twice. Um, mm -hmm. I left. Um, I, I left um, my parents when I was 16. I lived with a man who was, you know, was actually called sex trafficking today. He was uh, in his 30s. And um, I left him and then left the country. Um, I was 18, I think, when I left the country. I uh, went first went to the south of France, where I had originally wanted to escape. Um, then I moved from there to London. I lived there. Then I moved to Paris. And then I moved to New York. So all the, the cities that he had <coughs> named, mm. like thinking out loud, I went and lived in all of them. And then I, I, I landed in New York. And you were by yourself? Mm -hmm. and, and how did you had money? To, uh, no, no, I, I just found work everywhere, menial jobs. Actually, there, because I was so centralized, I attracted men very strongly, so there were a lot of offers that I didn't take. So there was a lot of modeling offers and that I just didn't, um, didn't feel comfortable, first of all, in front of it. It's been a long journey to feel okay in front of a camera because there were so many cameras used when I was a child and um, so I could not get over that trauma but also this idea that I should hide because he was a gangster you know so I should hide I should not speak and the not speaking was like I should be small I should keep myself really small so I just had menial jobs I did you know I was always good with languages so I would um, be secre do secretarial work or um, and I just made my way and 
made my way um, to, to New York. And um, where I'd been taken, where I'd been trafficked before. So there were things that were coming back, but I couldn't believe it. I started to remember things. So I'm a young adult now, and the images come back, but I can't believe it. And so it gets pushed back. Or every time something comes back, I start to think, oh, if that's true, I'm going to kill myself. That was rather common. Like, if that's true, and there was this, it was maybe repetitive sometimes, some images came back, uh, then I'm going to kill myself. So I'm trying to understand when you, <clears throat> when you, when you left Belgium, let's say, uh, you only had partial memories of... No, no memories, really. No memories. So you had gotten the advice from him to... Leave. I didn't remember him. You didn't even remember him. No. So you went through a period of somehow the... Long period. But, but I mean to say oh. the... At, like during the, during the time, during the time period we talked about, also, you didn't really have any memories of something that had happened, you know, six months before, a year, year before. Often, or. yes. And so when I met the, the, with the gangster who was asking me, I just answered. And in answering, I started remembering. So I had certain memories when he was asking me questions about things. It came back then. But yes, in the network, certainly I know I did not remember things. And was there some programming for you not to remember things as part of... Yeah, that was the whole point. I think the dissociation that happens through trauma is part of the training and um, to uh, get into an altar and then in the altar goes and pleases the man sexually. Um, that was definitely, I mean, that was always there through the abuse itself, but then there was also the actual training in Germany that um, was very specifically working with all this um, precise knowledge about how trauma works and how dissociation works and how alters can be um, called out right. through cues. Do you, do you feel like you had alters specifically? Sure, yeah. yeah, I had alters and I had certain cues. <laughs> Not through the network because I wasn't connected anymore. I'd been rejected by the one and then I'd been put out, taken, taken out, rescued by the other. So. I um, I didn't have actual cues to go and please men anymore from the network, like certain of people that I know, they got they would get a call and then there'd be, you know, the voice would say a word and they would go and do, go certain places and knew what they had to do. So that was never my case, but sometimes things were triggered uh, through certain cues, internal or external, and I would go into a certain program and... Mm. Uh, all quite unconsciously, really. Okay. So you're in New York. And how old were you when you got to New York? I was in my uh, 20s, early 20s. 23. 1985. Although it's possible that it was 1984, because I think the Challenger exploded right um, as I, after I got here. Okay. So... I um, I lived here for several years. Then I went to Los Angeles for a class and stayed there. And after some time there, I uh, st started going to therapy. And soon after I started therapy, I um, broke through something. They, uh, something was broken through. And I started to cry, and I just cried and cried and cried for three weeks. Cause I, and I felt that for the first time in my adult life, I found something real. And this was not something that had been repressed. It was something later on that had happened, that this person was abusive. And I had, was protecting them. I didn't see it as abusive. So... In the tears, I felt there's something real here, so I wanted to start exploring. So I started to go into deeper into therapy. I really liked uh, therapy. I really liked the concept. Um, 
And then I went to several therapists. I, or circumstances, I didn't really fire everybody, but that I just knew that I couldn't go farther. I could go this far, but no farther. I couldn't really... I started to get more and more flashbacks of the network, but I didn't have any context for it because I never heard of anything like that. That was just, I think, in the early 90s I started to hear about it. With the, they called it satanic panic. But in the 80s, um, I don't think... I wasn't... I never saw anything. I just didn't know where this could be coming from, how how this could possibly be true. And, and then... Um, so there were more and more flashbacks, but I just try to just push them back because every time I had a flashback I also had a, a suicide program I had a message that I should just kill myself and then these messages started becoming quite persistent of how I should kill myself and it became but I never wanted to go there it was a clear resistance to to it as well um, but um, then I moved back to New York in um, 97 and it was, I was already back in New York when I found out about the Dutroux case in Belgium. Right. And this was right when I was looking for <coughs> a therapist at the time. And the Dutroux case was suddenly giving me the context of my experiences. And people had already come forward and it was already at a place. I think I found out about it when the magistrate who was going to, who, who was sincere and who said he's going to get to the bottom of this he was already taken off the case and so I knew that nothing was going to happen um, so I never even considered testifying for the Dutroux case and all the testimonies because people did come forward and specifically one woman Regina Luf whose experience was very similar to mine um, as extreme similar people even uh, involved and of course I was before Dutroux was involved he's more my age so I was um, sold before he was old enough to be active but she um, had seen him and she started remembering a lot as she was testifying so she was very raw mm -hmm. um, but no you know the, the support system were the, the cops that were listening to her but those cops were thrown off the case as well. Right. So the Dutroux case gave me this context, but I still couldn't really quite believe it. Well, he himself was saying that there is a ring. He said that right. at first, yes. Afterwards, he said no. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. When he was first caught, he said that he was this the small, and you know, that he was uh, he had friends in high places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would protect him, which clearly. He was somewhat protected, um, but also 30, 30 people, there's a book out about 30 people that were killed that had some evidence leading to the existence of the network, mm. and all the testimonies relating to the, the network were cut off from the trial. That took eight years to come forward, to, to, to come to trial, so when 2004, by that time, um, when I distanced myself from Belgium a lot, obviously, and yeah. um, uh, that country, well, they, they've got something to deal with there that is not being dealt with. There's the, 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 the people went back into denial, mm -hmm. I think, and maybe ho hopelessness when nothing came of the Dutroux case. Um, but meanwhile, I found a therapist who, even though she, didn't, she wasn't a, an expert in this kind of work, she was open, and I started to... I started to get into the feeling, the feelings, so the horror, the horror of certain things that I'd witnessed and that I'd experienced, but it was mostly the horror, the pain was mostly for others, not so much for myself, it was for more for the other children. Um, and the betrayals, because I was so attached to these father figures. Right. And so, to, to move from the perspective that they were my father and that they were this person who loved me so much, to move from that perspective of the child 
to the perspective of the adult who sees the abuse and who just takes everything into, into consideration. That is the journey of healing from the child's perspective to connect with all the feelings that have had to be s split off in order to keep that image alive of that person. Yeah. And then these split off feelings, um, they have their own life. They're disconnected from the, from the source. And then, you know, I was constantly in some kind of part of my trauma story, always ex re-experiencing these feelings, but not really connected. So with the therapy and the specific connecting uh, of the feelings with the original cause, that into when that happened, when that, uh, when I was grieving in therapy for what had actually happened, first of all, I knew that it had happened. I didn't have to wonder if it was real or not. And, and I also knew a lot more because I understood. I understood. I, I was learning, you know, everything I saw, everything that I had done before that was separate, you know, how these feelings had gone into other places. Yeah. And I was seeing how um, I had been repeating these and I was seeing how uh, I was now different, actually cellularly different from the integration that, that was occurring, that I didn't just feel more whole, but I was actually a different person looking out of different eyes and people were responding to me differently. Mm. Uh, and the bigger the pain and the suffering and the, the bigger the, the issue or the betrayal that I was working through, the bigger the change and the integration afterwards. So I always felt this very spiritual, deeply spiritual work and feel this growth and it's exponential. Um, I get to be more myself. I get to get a sense of who I am through it, truly am versus what I've tried to impose, the, all the personas that I've tried to take on. You're talking about things that cannot be described in words, right? It's true. And we do our best. Yes. To, you know, our own experiences that don't have words and to put words to them, but their words become pointers mm -hmm. to say there is such an experience. You're, you're aware now there's such an experience, though you, you're not going to have the experience by just hearing about it. That's it's right. It's going to be by going through it. Exactly. You know? It's not the knowledge that's conveyed yeah. by passing along information. It's experiential, and um, it's actually the way through feeling, so com connecting those repressed feelings with their psychological cause causes this integration and the healing that I'm talking about. And that is, so my, my healing journey, that's been my life. The insights that I received, the wisdom that came from going through these, um, going through the pain, feeling the pain connected to its or origin, the wisdom I received through the suffering because I could see that this is true for me, and I could then also see that this is true for everyone who would be going through this. Right. So. Now, is it the feeling and being willing to be present to the feeling or sit with the feeling that allows you to follow it through to its source, its original? It, it can be anything. Events. Like sitting with the feeling and being with the feeling, it sounds almost funny because I would be, it was uh, at times so dramatic, so dark. So the tears were just um, the f physical pain, the physical endurance needed to even have the grief right. because it's so um, big. Um, but as opposed to running away from this uncomfortable feeling, away and taking right? pills. I right. mean, nothing against pills. You know, we all need to uh, be able to balance ourselves somehow. I've never taken medication. I've never taken any medication. Obviously, I uh, had suffered from massive depression, massive... Um, I could have been diagnosed probably as many different things. Mm -hmm. But I, my therapist, bless her soul, never really wanted to diagnose me because she wanted to see me as whole. That's, that's <laughs> you know, that's the start of, yes. start of healing is when you have someone who's helping you who says you're just fine the way you are, right? Yes. You're just fine the way you are. And she was helping me 
she became that reflection. She became the mother that I never had, or she became maybe an extension of the original caretaker who was also right. a, a, a sweet woman. So there was these qualities of humility and sweetness and um, acceptance and no judgment and mm. that um, um, like she could honor me for what I went through even if I couldn't honor myself. And she became the safe person. She was very thorough, very smart, so, so she wouldn't let anything pass. So she, because she was thorough, I started to trust her. That's how I picked her, actually, because she was thorough. She was um, mindful and thought things through. And she wanted to honor your commitment to feeling the feelings and getting through them. Yes. Right. Yes. And she and never had a question about, you know, even though we were going to these extremely dark places, there was never, you know, there was never, she never doubted it. Never doubt and never... You know, She'd never it, heard it, of it before. It was as it as you described it, and that's yes. how she handled it. Mm -hmm. And and was this a? Well, she helped me to know also that it was real mm. through her reflection. Um, like she, like it takes a long time to really fully because the, it's gradual. It's a gradual process. So there's always there would always be this moment that maybe it wasn't real. You know, maybe it was all, maybe I made it all up. So she would always help me, never, never imposing anything. Right. But just to help me, you know, get back to myself. And was this a, a psychotherapy? Yes. Yeah. This is classic psychotherapy. And then I, some years later, so I was already doing yoga then. So, um, I was in therapy, not with this therapist, but I was in therapy when I started yoga in the early 90s. And I immediately felt, oh, this is the physical therapy I've always needed because the breath, the breath and the movement alignment. So I used, um, so I wanted to use yoga, but I didn't like the way it was done. I was, uh, <laughs> It wasn't uh, conducive to healing, but I knew that it was healing, so I was doing it anyway, and just getting over the obstacles every time of the ignorance of the teachers a lot. So you're talking about like the typical westernization of mm -hmm. yoga mm -hmm. and going into a studio, and it's just mm -hmm. all about postures and posturing. and Which physical therapy I needed. It right. was great. But um, then I also entered, um, I was at a um, bookstore in Los Angeles, um, and saw there a picture, the picture of the being that I had seen when I was on the other side. <laughs> wow. And then that memory started to, started to come back. But again, it was like, no, but familiar and this question, man or woman, I don't know. That was all, it was a question even on the other side, man or woman, I don't know. So that was Paramahansa Yogananda. Speechless. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I started to, well, I read the book, the autobiography of a yogi. Mm -hmm. And I started going to the, I was, turns out I was living right by the temple, the Hollywood temple at the time. So I started uh, the meditations there in um, the early 90s. And I, I, so I'm, I'm still on that path. So that was the yoga, like the Raja yoga, the, the path. Yep. And then there was Hatha yoga, which was like the, the physical therapy, except that it was, that, that there was a lot of confusion in the Hatha yoga world, of what was spiritual and what was physical. So, but with the guru that I had, you know, I would just see these other gurus and the voila. Well, uh, they were falling back into the same issue as the people who were so powerful in my youth. And here are these, these other people who become gurus and who are becoming addicted to the power. Yeah, yeah. And I've always been uh, prone to wanting power because I didn't have any self-esteem. Mm. So without the self-esteem, uh, well, I said it earlier before we were recording, but 
And without self-esteem, it's really, really difficult to live. Because self-esteem navigates you yeah. through the world. And uh, without, without it, which was me for the longest time, no self-esteem, all there is, I mean, the best way is power. I mean, there's drugs, you know, to forget about everything. And then there's power, which is supported by everything in the world. Right. Like, okay, well, now I'm somebody. Um, and that was offered in the beginning through the, the photo modeling and everything. And then it came in different ways. It was always somehow there. And I was also attracting men of power just into my sphere because of my past because they were like oh there's something there for me <laughs> and like psychically I'm like okay I'll give it to you <laughs> mm. uh, but not really because now I'm not um, I don't have to so uh, no um, particular physical contact with people of power or fame you know kind of the same a different version of the the same addiction um, so I I was always observing. I felt like a spy. I, I was trained as a spy mm -hmm. um, to find people's weaknesses. But now I, was, I always felt like I was a little bit spying into sort of the power dynamics, looking at power dynamics and how people we respond differently around someone with power or how they respond differently to me according to how they see me. Right. So, uh, so in my own healing, there were certain people who were able to get through to me. So at first I was completely shut off, shut down as a young adult. Nobody could get through. And then certain people did. And so my therapist was like, the therapist I mentioned was over the long, over a long run she got through to me. But there were people who could do it in an instant. And they all had these particular things in common. I saw them as an authority. So whatever, for whatever reason, they were, I put them in a position of authority over me. So I gave them my power. But they didn't act like it. They didn't act like they were attached to that power. They didn't need, they weren't addicted themselves. So they, they didn't need this status. But they didn't need the power I gave them. So they were humble. So they weren't playing the role. Because if I see somebody as powerful, if I have that projection, they're actually already an abuser. They're a substitute abuser for me. And I'm going to do what people do with people who are scary. I'm going to please them right. like a child. So I'm going to placate them. But they don't care about that either. They don't want me to uplift them. They don't need that. Right. So then I'm like, well, there's something off here in this dynamic. <laughs> it's not working. Um, but I can also tell you that a lot of men absolutely are <laughs> you know when you yeah. start to sure. to butter them up they they really yeah. love it <laughs> they need it yeah. um, and then that's it but then they're done for me right i'm done with them then right but um those people that were not attached to it they were not playing the role of the abuser then i would start to test them because now they're you know they're safe right they've now told me that they're not the scary person they're safe so i'm going to like start poking yeah yeah to see if it's just a clever ruse on their part. They're playing a... Yes, and this young game. part in me uh, needs, needs love. Needs real love versus abuse. Mm. So she's trying to, to test this. Right. Like children do. So now, then I'll be testing. And then, well then, there's another whole bunch that would leave you then right there, you know, because then they judge you. And then there's some people that didn't judge me. So if, I, if they were not judging me then, then it's like completely confused. And this state of confusion, it's in the power dynamic, starting with someone who I saw as an abuser, and it goes for everybody, but in this, this specific power dynamic, like say two people, they have gone against my expectations several times, and here I am, I'm vulnerable, just like the moment before abuse happens, there's vulnerability because you feel <clears throat> something's different, but you don't quite know what. So there's this moment. And in that moment, I could just be vulnerable, and then that would be it. But if they said something verbally that was an, aff an affirmation of me, that was something confirming that I'm valid, mm. that I have valid as 
validity as a human being that I'm good. They can just say you're a good person or um, something specific about me that's positive. Then it would immediately throw me into the healing, into the grief actually. It would immediately make it clear that I was projecting the difference with the abuser before, the, um, that I, that the, the difference with what the, the, the abuser had originally done versus what was happening here, the unconditional love that I was receiving now, the acceptance, and that's what moved me away gradually from this idea that the abusers are all powerful and that I have to adhere right. to their rules right. completely, which I guess I never <clears throat> completely did. So finally you had some models that were powerful and yet uh, would not take advantage of that. You could allow yourself to be vulnerable and then the, at that moment something resonated. If it's, a, if it's a very high sort of idea or emotion or feeling, it just resonates. You say, that's real. That's, yes. re that's more real than this game that I was in yes. before. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's the model of unconditional love. And that's the basis, those four conditions are the basis of the unconditional model, which is a healing modality that I've come up with in, in my years of the work that I've been doing. And, but this was before these things happened, before I had any self-esteem, when I really needed the power, and I didn't have any way to navigate myself. It was difficult, difficult to live because I didn't really want the power. I wanted it, but I didn't want it. Mm. So it was very difficult. It's very difficult to say no to the power and then feel all the feelings on the other side of it. Because <laughs> when you look at someone who has power, you can just assume that on the other side of that high that they're getting there, that, they're, that you may be giving them mm -hmm. by putting them up there. Because you know, this new politician who is going to make a change, you know, whatever you're doing there, on the other side of that is their sense of humiliation, their insecurity about who they are. Um, that's the darkness, is that the child's fears that they're bad. And invariably, with all the people in power, all of them, they have this other side, which is a hurt little child that they cannot get in touch with because the shame is too great and their protection of their own power figures has been too strong, too, they're too afraid to break out of it, they're too un, uh, badly equipped me mentally, emotionally to, so it's the weak people that have power and that perpetuate the system of power abuse Right. and that requires that a whole segment of the population is suffering right so that they can feel that they deserve where they are and whether it's the prisoners people of color in this country <clears throat> women uh, to a large degree but then women are also in the different categories but they're always they always are, I think most women are aware that they don't have the privilege of men right um, through all the harassment and the disrespect that you get as a woman so it's all set up and in a way that you're supposed to climb and that climbing means from poor to rich and it means to move away from your trauma mm -hmm. and your pain to the top where you can be in the role of the authority that was abusive to you when you were little so that you can then pass it on onto everybody that's below you. Yeah, and in the process not have to experience it within yourself. All to avoid that. Yeah. It's all to avoid that. So this outer war, <clears throat> to a certain degree, in the state of the world, has a lot to do with each person, not just those powerful persons who are the sickest elements among us. That's why they're not among us. They are, they are covering their sickness all the time. Like psycho mm. Psychopathy is a, an intelligent psycho psychopath is maybe the most dangerous person on earth. Because, you know, there are psychopaths who, who have maybe 20 victims, but the psychopaths that are in charge of the world, they are creating, you know, um, hundreds of millions of victims. 
without blinking. Yeah. And there's definitely that sickness. And the, the, the reason that the world is in this state is because they're brainwashing. There's a, the, so there's, first there's this, this hurt little child is hiding underneath the powerful person. And the armor is the power that's around them. So you never get to the, the child and they don't either. And then there's all these lies that have to be put out to keep the lie in place that a person of power at, is actually that big authority that we need to listen to. Because if we don't listen anymore, if we don't give them that power, if we do, then there will be no, nothing. There, it nothing will be gone. Nothing giving them that power. So, so that really speaks to that kind of leads us into this idea of how do we heal the planet now in this time of awakening? How do we, what's our role as individuals in that process? So what would you, if you can expand on that, like for, for everybody that's, that's watching? So my um, role, I guess, has something to do with the experiences that I went through. And um, we're all about power. I was always looking at power. And the healing modality has to do with looking at power dynamics in order to look at external power dynamics and how we fit in there, and internal power dynamics. That's to say, who do we still look up to as our internal children that have been traumatized, that are still looking for a savior, still looking for daddy, still looking for mommy? And who do we look down to as uh, these aspects of ourselves that we have yet to embrace, that we have the shame, that we have been shamed, so we have, um, we have uh, rejected those aspects of ourselves. We cannot face that, you know, yeah. too much shame. Um, that's who we judge. So I spent most of my adult life looking down on extremely powerful men. Whereas most people, it's a little bit different, right? It's like if you're more into the, the, the conventional power structure, you would look down on the poor because right. they're not, you know. Um, but somebody who is completely in line with the conventional power structure, uh, whose inner and outer chart of the power structure is completely is the same as the outer inner is the same as the outer that would be a psychopath that's somebody who has who looks up to people who are in power and looks down at people who are not and just basing their own self-esteem and sense of self and identification all based on where they are at in this power uh, structure uh, external power structure so all their value comes from without and, and, and this network and the people in this network, what, their big motivation is to rise up in the structure and keep yes. getting higher and higher so yes. that they have more power to exert and more of a group below them to, yes. to oppress. I'd or say. they're born into it, and, um, but the, those who are born into it. So at the bottom of this is child abuse. And so the agenda is to sexualize and pornography, you know, the pornification of everything and the sexualization of everything, that the eventual goal of that is that the child abuse would be um, accepted. And you do your research, I'm sure you know that there's a lot of voices that are going in that direction, especially in Belgium and Holland, which is, I think, I think that um, we were sort of like a test market for the agenda. Oh, yeah? I think so. I think so. It's certainly a, a concentration of those, those most, you know, these ideas that directly come from the agenda that I overheard mm -hmm. this um, perpetrator speak about with his friend. Um, so with the, like, there, there's, so there's an attempt out there to sexualize. Yes. And normalize. Normalize child um, sexual abuse. So that, that is the, the hurt child self. Those children from the families are also abused. They're also being indoctrinated into the system through abuse. Yeah. And some of them have also been trained, like me, 
were also sent to these training facilities, which are not training, it's just torture, um, and used for special purposes. And um, so I think that the, the way to humanize the most evil men and women in the world um, is to say that to look at the fact that privilege exists and privilege acts as this external um, um, way to keep the system in place, that you, you're born into privilege, then you never even know that you're attached to it. But it's at the expense of all these people who don't have that privilege. Right. So that's how it works. And the more privilege you have, you can be completely ignorant and think that you're just, you know, a good person, except that that this your ignorance is causing all this pain yeah. with people who don't have that privilege, um, and it's just the awareness of it. It's not that well you're you know there's something wrong for you for being born. No, it's just being aware of what you're receiving just by being male is a really big one, but white is another big one, and um, you know this know what you're receiving for free that. You may have a set, you may think that you you have a good self esteem and, and wonder why the woman doesn't, for example, mm. you know, and um, I can tell you why she doesn't. <laughs> but that privilege is these layers, layers of the societal layers that um, keep the structure in place. That the great equalizer is that the children are all vulnerable. So children are born, they may be born with privilege, but they don't have any power. Mm. And as children, all children are the same, and they're all vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. They're the most vulnerable. And so the system goes to the children and perverts them uh, because someone who completely is completely loyal to their perpetrator, their abuser, that they loved, and children love. So this... My main perpetrator, he was loving his abuser. Mm. And that's how he was being loyal, by b abusing me. Mm. And doing everything that he did was in loyalty to this, um, ab their abuser. So he was coming from a five-year-old boy place. Yeah, they were modeling it for him, and then he was going yes. ahead and doing that. As he was doing that. He was now the, the, exactly, just no, no healing in between. And um, there's this loyalty to the abuser. That is the crux of the paradigm, is loyalty to the abuser. Loyalty to the power is loyalty to the abuser. And their own children are being abused. And I think that's the way that we can come back to some form of compassion. Because the, the, the deeds are so dark. Yeah. And mo a lot of people have trouble even um, understanding how anybody could ever do anything like that. And there, there's a lot to talk about how somebody can, gets to a point where they do that. Yeah. I know. I know how, why they do it, how they do it. And, uh, but, but I can talk about it all day, but let's just say that most people hear something like that and go, how could anybody, I have a heart, I'm a human being, how can one human being do that to another human being, especially a child? Yeah, so we, so we can say, so right now, you can take a look at the world and look at the power structure and you can say that whole power structure is founded on child abuse. The abuse of the children within that power structure as the foundation of their later psychopathic behavior and desire to rule and to, uh, to have power over others in that way. Absolutely. So that's what, that's what we're dealing with as opposed to we're dealing with isolated incidents of this abuse and that abuse. It's actually the foundation of the system. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that we need to come to grips with and mm -hmm. realize. Mm -hmm. It actually is very enlightening to come to that realization. And then from there, try to piece together not just the power structure, but our relationship to it. Right. In other words, you were talking about you can tell something about a person if there's an alignment with the 
the power. Right. It means we're all somewhere on the scale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it means you know if you're totally aligned and, and you just flow into it, mm -hmm. it means you're psychopathic. Right. It means you're looking up to people who have external power but no internal power. Right. You look down to people who have no external power but obviously they have power because they're enduring the life exactly. that they've had to endure. The strength that comes from that is not to be um, um, ignored. Yeah. Well, that's, and, and once we, so, so from that side But of it's it, not valued. Well, it's not valued, yeah. Yet. It's not, I mean, that's why we're talking, it, one of the reasons we're talking today is to bring value to it and make mm -hmm. people realize people that have, have suffered, they're humble, they're good people, they, they try to serve others, how much, not just value to themselves, to their friends, but how much value bringing that forth has in the healing of the world if we all come together and realize how we have the power. We have the power. Yeah. We do. Yeah. So, we, so my, my model is about going inside first. Not outside, but first going inside, looking at our internal power structure to break out of our own internal prisons of power structures yeah. to heal because once we do that, the external structure will fall away. That was my journey from being completely, you know, caught in that power structure to doing more and more internal work. And the more internal work I was doing, the less the outer values mattered to me. So that's each one's journey, personal journey. But on um, an awareness level, it's to understand. I think if, if you assume, if you're looking at a politician, assuming that they, there's a, a, a hurt little child there that is in need to prove to how big they are, even if they're not maybe boisterous because, you know, with Trump, Everybody, you know, there's this huge distraction with Trump that uh, it's just such a great way to keep the division going. Like, oh, yeah, fantastic. You know, what a great idea. I would have done the same thing if I was, if I was mm, a social engineer. Um, uh, it's like, it seems like we're going backward because everybody, all the liberals are focusing on Trump now. But um, meanwhile, everything's happening behind everybody's back and every, uh, all the... The, 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 the dark agenda is being furthered very well, and not because of Trump, but because of, um, because of um, um, the agenda uh, that Trump is also just a part of. He's not, a, he's not, a, he's not like some people in the community of uh, uh, believe that he's a, like a white, or whatever, a white hat or whatever. He's not. He's not. He is part of it. He always was. And he's no different. He just doesn't quite belong because he was the vulgar one, right? He's the one who, who's not, um, who doesn't play the game in the smart way. He's just too obvious. But um, he's easy, an easy target. And that's why, you know, look, at, look how easy he was. And um, it's just to serve as such a distraction and everybody falling for it, I'm really stunned. That everybody has fallen for it to this degree, um, but I'm all even with low expectations. I'm still a little bit stunned that it's worked that well. Um, and then I live in the United States too, so there's a lot of people that don't have the distance that people from outside um, have. But um, if you look at any person who needs power, any person. Uh, wh whether they're on your political team or the opposite political team, whether they're really smart. No, like I read, I, I was looking something Hollywood, a Hollywood type thing, and I was reading, I was reading, I was following the uh, Asia Argento story because I thought it was very um, particular and um, a good example in a way of power and she was threatening, you know, she was coming from this place of uh, revenge and threats and then, you know, everything that's happened since then. Yeah. Um, um, but I was just reading the, the letter that, uh, a letter that was put out in that, in that context by a lawyer. That letter 
really very cleverly um, addressed the Me Too movement and the concerns of the Me Too movement that if you are interested in Me Too, you're going like, yeah, that's right, that's exactly right, I'm with you. And then it would say, Hollywood has always stood against the abuse of children. And then that line stands out to me because that's what Hollywood is all about. Except we haven't accepted that quite yet. Mm. You know, there was one that was outed, and then that story kind of went away quickly. He lost his job and whatever, but still, we're not really talking about that story. We don't really want to believe yet that the media is really just a tool, and that the bigger, it's always the same thing. The bigger they are, and the more important you think they are, the more they've been compromised, and the more it means that they are uh, being um, controlled by the people that have the dark agenda um, that, that have no good intentions for anybody. Yeah. So even the alternative media has been co-opted and then it becomes like the, you know, it's the, the, oppo the controlled opposition. It's, it's, a, it's, very, it's a very well-oiled machine and to break out of it we have to really understand that it's the system itself that anybody who is big and powerful that you want to follow you got to look at yourself and ask yourself why you want to follow that person. Why you want to trust CBS that's or whatever. A, that's a great point. I mean, I wanted to come back to this idea of uh, each individual's healing journey and how it relates to uh, how they relate to people that mm -hmm. they admire, the authority, right. and then how they relate to people that, you know, they might be projecting onto or judging yes. or discriminating against. And the authority, that's also a projection. So that's what, that's what uh, power uh, addicts live on, on those projections of power. So if you think that this star, for example, you know, any star is the, the greatest thing on earth, you know, and such a good minister, da, 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 you think that you're already projecting. But, and as much as you love this person that you don't know, you are still... Um, placating, sending this energy out, that, that's why I was so prone to it, because when people, a lot of people like you at the same time, or a lot of men think you're desirable, you know, you feel that, you become, you look more beautiful, I look more beautiful, I would look more beautiful if there's men desiring me around, I actually start to look more beautiful. Um, I, I feel it, it's pleasant, it's a vibration, it's kind of like heroin, it feels like, like that, it feels like a heroin high. So it's not to be uh, dismissed, the energy that we send. But then we have to say when we do that, when we send that energy, we're already projecting. This is already a stand-in for some authority figure from our past who was hypocritical in a sense that they were hurting us, but they needed us to, to make them good. And so we're already doing that. As soon as you have an, 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 an admiration for someone that... Um, and you just put them up. Yeah. You put them up on a pedestal. So there's always that inequality that's created, and so then it becomes rather than relating to someone as a fellow human being, right? Where there's as kind of that neutral as an equal equality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, and you feel like you know, let's do stuff together, and there's this projection to to above, and then there's. It's, would you call it projection below as uh, well? Yeah. yeah, yeah, there has to be. If there's above, so below. <laughs> yeah, okay. So what, what can we, uh, you know, from your own experience, what can we suggest to people to, I guess, for their own healing journey, pay attention to in terms of this power structure? Is it, is it really all about coming to the realization that when you're really in balance, you everything's at the level with everyone else, and there's no judgment on this side. There's no kind of adulation on this side. It kind of becomes, and that, but that right. comes after the work, right? After the work. Well, I like to think of the maybe the, the as a model, maybe the matrilineal um, native tribes, where um, there's a true egalitarian concept that everyone is honored as a human being and of course we honor the earth mm -hmm. we honor the earth as a as a as a very big but very sensitive mother figure and um, the connection to the earth and the female strength like females have been enduring 
for thousands of years. And as mothers, and because of the abuse that we've suffered, I think to recognize once we get into the healing, when we start to heal, we start our healing journey, that's really where the strength comes from. Because if you've been through hell, but you, you haven't healed, then you haven't learned anything. Yeah. But you've been through hell, then you start to heal from it. You start to go and feel the pain. You start to become more conscious. It is to also then know that that is where it's at. That that is really the strength. That that's real strength. That I'm very small in the world. And thank God, because if I were very big, I would be in a lot of danger probably. But I'm relatively small. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, everywhere. I'm not being seen everywhere. So I'd like to just, so we'll wrap up mm -hmm. in like mm -hmm. five minutes um, talking about healing and talking about uh, yourself not being big. I, I, I kind of saw where you were going with that, like not being this big attractor of attention and creating those dynamics, but just having an experience of relating to people slowly and, and, and having more of those relationships come together on an egalitarian level and building whatever builds from there. And there's no need to have like, you know, a huge mass of people admiring you and stuff like that. No, but there is real strength there that comes from the healing and having felt into it. Um, there's the fact that, you know, the surviving itself, I want to say, um, you know, you either survive or you don't survive. There's no difference. I mean, there's no difference in the sense of stronger, better, blah, 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 none, none of that. So you either survive or you don't survive. Then if you survive, then um, if you can take that opportunity, if it's possible, yeah. if you have it within you, if you've had maybe enough of a blueprint of love, I don't know, somewhere from somewhere, whether it, whether it was always spiritual or whether it was a human being who gave you um, the love that you had some si sense of what love means, to um, know that that's... Um, that, that that is what's what's needed and the empathy that is created from doing the work on yourself is direct from experience. You can only be empathic if you know what that person is feeling right. because you've been through it. Yeah. So you empathize. And that empathy, um, if we can honor that ourselves, and I think for women especially, to really honor that humble work and to honor um, the healing from the pain that we, and you know, it, it doesn't end. Being a woman, it doesn't end. You know, you're always in this, uh, at risk of being treated like really badly just for being female. So you get, um, you get to work on yourself all the time. You, you know, you'll, you won't forget. <laughs> you won't suddenly get so privileged that you'll forget it. Mm. Um, and I think that's where the key lies working with um i work a lot with survivors and i work a lot with survivors of sexual abuse and you know most women seem to be survivors of sexual abuse it's so ingrained in the culture um, incest perpetrators are extremely common but they're not often persecuted um, uh, pedophiles are protected by law you could say you know even though there's a, a big uh, stigma around it they're also protected they don't get really uh, serious sentences at all. So there's this whole institutional protection of child abuse and of abusers. And um, anyone who's trying to break out of it can have a really hard time. It requires a lot of courage today to break out of that and to speak up, whether it's in one community where abuse is taking place, power abuse is taking place, we stand a lot to, there's a lot to lose. So you have to have that, that, that courage. Um, that means, courage just means to feel the fear and then do it anyway. Right. Um, and what I notice is that a lot of women who have been abused uh, will tend to fall victim again, like to 
someone who comes along as the big savior and who's going to basically use their stories to serve their purposes and make the women feel that they owe him. You know, that, that happens a lot. So as a survivor, I've met a lot of those types. So I say, well, I tell the women, I mean, your story is important. It's your, yeah. you get to do what you, you get to share it in the way that you want. Yeah. That's safe for you when you're ready. And nobody, you know, nobody else needs to get the credit for that. That's right. That's, and that's exactly, you know, how I feel being here and uh, helping you tell your story and getting it to our audience. Because for me, at this stage, now, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, almost impossible yes. to get a story out, to get your voice heard. And now, you know, I have a sense uh, more people are willing to listen, more people are willing to read that article on that subject that they weren't going to touch five years ago. They don't want to hear about it, but people are starting to wake up and they're starting to realize we, we can't avoid hearing about and knowing about these things anymore. We can't. It, it, there's a feeling that yes. to move forward we have to face these. It's, it's facing, yes. you know, like hearing about your story or facing one's own negative emotions, taking a look at mm -hmm, them and saying, mm -hmm. where, where is this coming from and why does it keep coming up in these situations? Exactly. You know? exactly. Which is, you know, what you said yes. is, is what you encountered in your healing journey. But if you're not asking those questions, you're not going to re reach mm -hmm. that point where you really get to the truth of mm -hmm. where they came and then let, let all that energy dissipate and, and feel better about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. Um, and, and probably I, in the energetically, in the way that you've approached me, that was clear that you have that kind of attitude, you know, that you value, that you put value on uh, the fact that I've lived through it and that I've come out of it and I've been able to spend 30 years healing and that, that, um, that allows me to sit here and speak about it, you know. Mm. Um, and for men, I think, you know, it's not just for women, obviously. Uh, for women, it's to understand that, that their story um, is uh, valid and that they are valid. And for men, I think what happens to men often is that they start to immediately go to this place of powerlessness. And, you know, they hear something, it's so overwhelming, and men have been programmed uh, brainwashed to feel that they should do something about it right, right. away. So men feel powerless. <clears throat> and I think, again, it seems to go against the flow, but to understand that this person who's feeling really powerless, you know, um, who is that? How old is that boy who's feeling that way? Because to find your role that's from within, it's, you know, meditation is a really good way to go within. But anything that's spiritual can be used as, 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 as a bypass so that you don't have to then feel anything again. Mm -hmm. But for men, to, to first to recognize and accept the feeling of hopelessness and, or, or feeling of powerlessness and frustration from accepting this truth that these things happen. And all the feelings that that brings up, brings about, and to 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 accept them, they're completely valid. Whatever reaction comes is completely valid. Mm -hmm. And then, once you can embrace that reaction within yourself, you can uh, take it from there, because um, people react from whatever place they're at emotionally. So if you want to go kill those people, then there's that comes from a place of your own healing journey yep. where there's the anger needs to be expressed. That's the next step. That's the step they're at. Yes. Exactly. Very helpful, except if you want to go kill those people and cut off their heads, you know, we, we don't want to get stuck there. We don't want a revolution that way. <laughs> Pitchforks and... Right. Um, exactly. And that's, you know, in, in the Facebook era, you put an article 
and you see people having the need to comment how disgusting, disgraceful, yes. awful, terrible, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And my hope is that, okay, yes. fair enough. Yes. Fair enough. Are you going to then go back to sleep? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And because it's too overwhelming. Yeah. You know, but that anger is, says something about you. And it's something perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. What it's saying is really important information. It's telling you where you are. Where you are yeah. And that's good. Yeah. So, so be it. We're all at different uh, sort of stages in our own healing. And, and again, for me, uh, being able and willing to sit with your testimony about something so difficult to hear is a courageous act. And, you know, obviously I'm inviting our, our viewers to, uh, to engage in that and to, to watch this through. Yes. Okay, so once again, not much else to share uh, at, at, at part three here at the end um, because we just want to get through the rest of this in part four and then we'll discuss a little bit further. But uh, one quick note, what you're going to hear at the beginning of part four is a little bit of a repeat of, as to what has happened in part uh, at the end of part two. And the reasons for that was just the way Annika wanted to describe and explain something after she finished the, the part where she was asked to essentially kill somebody um, at the end of, of part two there so that we could bring that together properly. So if a little bit at the beginning of part four seems, seems a little bit repetitive, it's because that little five minute part is in there as well. So we'll catch you in part four where we continue the end of this journey and discuss a little bit further what the key takeaways are here.